So I was just going to give a brief overview of ECR funding opportunities that are available at EPSRC. Um, so just to give a quick overview of sort of UKRI and EPSRC. So EPSRC is one of the nine funding councils that fits under UKRI. Um, so that's Engineering and Physical Sciences, STFC, Innovate, Research England, Arts and Humanities, uh, NERC, MRC and ESRC. Um, so each of these councils obviously has a specific focus. So EPSRC is Engineering and Physical Sciences. So we look after the Engineering and Physical Sciences research that goes on under UKRI. And then things like ESRC, that's more economics and societal focused. Um, so UKRI sits under BASE, which is the government department that funds UKRI. <coughs> and so looking at UKRI's strategic objectives. So the UKRI strategy was recently published, and this has a focus on... Um, sort of five areas, so that's people and careers, places, innovation, ideas, and impacts, and these are underpinned by a world-class organization, which is UKRI. Um, so these are things looking at, so people and careers, this is obviously focused on ensuring we have the right talent and people in teams within the UK um, to ensure that that research can be undertaken. Um, places, so this is addressing the UK places, uh, the UK government's places, um, sort of priority, um, and then impacts obviously focused on ensuring we get the correct impacts from the research that we fund across UKRI. Um, so this is what the UKRI strategy objectives are focused on. Um, so moving on to EPSRC, these obviously contribute to the UKRI um, strategy. So we have uh, three discovery-led research priorities. These are physical and mathematical sciences, frontiers in engineering and technology, and digital futures. Um, and then we also have four mission-inspired, sort of translational research-inspired um, areas. So these are engineering net zero, AI digitalization and data, transforming health and healthcare, and quantum technologies. Um, and these are underpinned by international talent and skills, place, world-class infrastructure, impact, and business engagement. So ensuring we have the correct ecosystem to actually underpin all of these things. Um, so moving on to funding opportunities within EPSRC. Um, so I'll be covering these, um, the first four in more detail. So there's open fellowships, new investigator awards, standard grants, and discipline hopping grants. Uh, we also have network grants, program grants, overseas travel grants, and Daphne Jackson fellowships. There are a couple of others that I haven't mentioned here, so it's just things like CBTs, um, as these aren't necessarily as relevant to today. Um, so when looking and thinking about what grant you might be applying to, I think it's important to think about the purpose of your grant, so whether it's research-focused or developing yourself as a leader. Um, so if it's research-focused, then thinking about whether you're a new academic or whether you've potentially applied for grants and had grants before. Um, so if you're a new academic, it would be things like new investigator awards, um, potentially standard grants and discipline hopping. Um, and if you've applied before, then you'd be more looking at standard grants, discipline hopping, and program, program grants. Um, but if you're looking more at developing yourself as a future leader, um, you'd be looking at things more like a fellowship. Um, so EPSRC's Open Fellowship is some flexible funding um, for a fellowship focusing on any topic within the EPSRC portfolio. Um, to apply for this, you must have either a PhD or at least four years funding uh, four years experience, sorry, in a relevant field um, before starting that fellowship. So it's open to any career stage, so there's no rules on the number of years of postdoctoral experience that you need, um, or whether you hold an academic position. And there's no um, requirement for EPSRC funding to already be held. Um, so we encourage applications from candidates following non-standard career paths, um, so this is things like people moving back into research after having a career break um, or any other sort of break. Um, so the fellowship, the fellowship itself supports academics to establish or further develop themselves as future leaders. Um, so looking at fellowships and sort of comparing this to our standard research grants, um, you can see some of the aims of the fellowships are obviously more to do with um, having the flexibility to develop yourself. So whereas research grants are very much focused on sort of research deliverables and things like that, in the fellowship you have the flexibility to undertake training, 
Um, the flexibility to allocate time to drive research cultural changes. So this is one of the aspects of the, the plus part of open fellowships, which I'll go on to in a second. Um, fellowships also, there's the expectation that a significant time commitment will be spent on this, so at least 50% of your time. Um, and this can often reduce your responsibilities within your host organisation, such as teaching and administration. Uh, so as I mentioned, there's no need for the recipient of the fellowship to have EPSRC funding already. Um, but you need to be able to demonstrate you've acquired the skills and expertise for delivering this research, um, whatever that is. Um, you have to have identified areas for continued professional development. And you need to be committed to implementing good practice in creating an inclusive research environment throughout your fellowship and also advocating for EPSRC to influence policymakers, other stakeholders, and other things um, to highlight the importance of your research that you're going to be undertaking. Um, so moving on to the plus component that you can have for fellowships. So this isn't a requirement, but if you want to, you can add this plus component. And this is focused on spending around 20 to 50% of your time to create a positive change in the research community. So some examples of this can be EDI, responsible research and innovation, public engagement or policy. Um, and this is to champion an area, so one of these topics aligned to EPSRC aspirations to deliver improvements in research culture. Um, so the PLUS Fellowship, the resources um, can be up to five years at 50 to 100% of your, of your time. Um, you can have things like travel and subsistence, visiting researchers, consumables, access to facilities. Um, so all of these are for both Open and PLUS. But for the PLUS Fellowship, um, you can also get time and resource to address community issues. Um, so in terms of assessment of our fellowships, so this is applicable to both Open and the Open PLUS Fellowships. Um, so this goes to two stages. So you submit your proposal um, and then it goes to review, and if it's got supportive reviews, then it goes to your prioritization panel. And at this panel, you'll be looking at research quality, applicant and partnerships, national importance, and resources and management. If you're successful at that stage, it'll go on to an interview, and the interview will focus on fellowship vision and delivery, community leadership, team leadership, and continued professional development. And if you've applied for an Open Plus Fellowship, there will be an additional criteria, which is community champion. Um, so moving on from the fellowships to new investigator awards. So these are awards to support early career academics to begin to establish um, their own research group and establish that research independence. Um, so this is specifically for people who haven't received um, significant grant funding before. Um, and there's also the expectation on the host organization that they will support the career progression of the applicant um, throughout their new investigator award. So to be eligible for this, you have to have not previously led uh, an academic research group. Um, you can't be a recipient of significant grant funding, so that's from any funding organization, not just EPSRC. Um, you can't be applying to EPSRC as a PI for the first time. Um, so there are some exemptions for this, and you can find those on our website. Um, the project itself should also be self-contained and compromise a single research vision. So it can't be a complex research project. It has to be something simple and focused. Um, so you, you can apply if you've been a co-I previously, um, but I would suggest discussing that with a PM before you actually apply for that. Um, there's no closing date for this, so you can apply at any time. It's always open. And there's no funding caps or duration caps, so you can apply for whatever funding you need, and the grant can be as long as you need it to be as well, or as short. Um, so how is a new investigator award different to a standard grant? Um, so the new investigator is focused on career, de career development, both in terms of resources requested and focusing on needing that support from your host organization. So thinking about what's good support from your host organization, so there's things like PhD provision, so your host organization might um, provide you with a PhD um, as part of their support package. 
Um, they could have sort of specific training packages to help your career pro progression and train you in any specific skills you've identified as needing. Um, and then also um, other things like mentoring, um, sort of taking things off your workload. So this could be reducing your teaching um, expectations within the organization. Um, so basically, you should discuss with your host organization what sort of specific support you need in terms of that mentoring, training, how you might need to re reduce your workload and other support they might offer. So you should discuss this with your host organization because that will form a key part of your host organization letter of support when you write that up. Um, and it will obviously be assessed during the, the assessment process of new investigator award. Um, so there's also standard grants. So this is generally the standard way that most people apply to EPSRC. So this supports a very wide range of research programs. Um, so the key features of this, so it's always open, so there's no closing date. There's no fixed value, so you can apply for as much or as little as you need, um, and for as long or as short as grant duration that you need. Um, there's no constraints on the field of research, as long as it's within EPSRC remit, or at least within 50% of it has to be EPSRC remit. So if it's interdisciplinary, so 40% of it might be within ESRC or MRC, as long as at least 50% is within EPSRC, you can apply, and that's the same as for all of our grants as well. Um, so activities funded through standard grants, so this is things like feasibility studies, um, it can be instrument development, so if you're developing specific instruments that are, are novel, um, you can apply for funding for that. Um, you can apply for project-specific equipment. It can be uh, collaborative projects that are cross-disciplinary, like I just mentioned. Um, it can be high-risk and high-return research proposals, so proof-of-concept type stuff can be funded through this. Um, and as long as you justify all the resources requested, most things can be applied for. Um, so moving on to discipline hopping. So this scheme encourages researchers with an ICT experience to use their research skills in a different discipline or for people in a different discipline to learn ICT research skills themselves. Um, so to apply for this, you should have a proven track record of research in your home discipline and wish to develop the skills and collaborations with other disciplines or users. Um, and you must be showing how you'll use this interdisciplinary research and collaborative development in the ICT research community. So further details can be found on our website. Um, so other opportunities, so the Daphne Jackson Fellowship is to support um, academics returning after a career break. Uh, so network grants, this is a grant um, to help support the creation of new interdisciplinary communities and topics. So this is what this grant, this uh, Network Plus. So Network Plus, the plus aspect is the ability to sort of give out their own funding as well. Um, and then there's also overseas travel grants. So this is to support travel to start or develop um, international collaborations. So that funding's not for setting up conferences and things like that. Um, so you can ask for funds for international travel and subsistence um, to cover salaries. Um, and even if you got, get one of those, you're still eligible to apply for a new investigator award in the future. So moving on to the application and the peer review process. So if you submit a proposal to us, this will go to one of the portfolio managers. Um, so it could go to me if it's focused around data science, or it could go to um, another PM within the ICT theme or engineering theme, depending on what the focus is of that research. Um, so the portfolio manager will read the proposal and select um, appropriate reviewers based on what the proposal is about. Um, you would have been able to give at least three um, applicant reviewers as well, and we try and get at least one applicant reviewer per proposal. So you will suggest three people that you think are relevant to reviewing that. So it's important to keep in mind there that these people should not have any conflicts of interest, because if they do, we obviously can't use those, and you would have lost those people as potential reviewers. Um, so once those reviews come in, the portfolio manager will look at whether they're supportive or unsupportive. Um, if at least two of those are supportive, then it will go out to a PR response. This is the chance for you as the applicant to actually rebut some of those comments in the, in the um, 
in the reviews. So uh, it's worth spending a bit of time looking at this and thinking about how you're going to respond to those comments. Um, so after that stage, it'll go to the actual peer review panel. Um, and then that will get put into a rank ordered list by the panel looking at the peer review comments and it will be ranked from what they think is the highest quality down to the lowest quality. Um, and then the theme lead who is the budget setter will go down that list and depending on how much funding is available will decide where that cutoff is. Um, so it's worth noting just because you've come below that funding cutoff doesn't mean your research wasn't fundable. It just means we have limited funds and we can't fund everything which is obviously unfortunate, but that's the way all the world works. Um, so following that, you'll either be funded or you'll be unfortunately unfunded. Um, so when submitting a proposal, it's obviously key to look at what the assessment criteria to try and make sure you actually address all of those within your grant um, and how you've written it. So all of these can be found on our website. So it's worth taking a look at that before you start writing a grant. Um, as well, you can look at the reviewers' forms and the guidance notes. So these are all available online. So you can look at how we actually ask reviewers to assess things and some of the notes there, which can obviously be helpful in thinking about how you frame things and what, how things are going to be assessed. Um, additionally, if you're not sure of where your proposal fits in terms of remit within EPSRC or other councils, then we have a remit inquiries. So if you go online, this is um, like a smart survey and you can fill it in and that will get sent to the most appropriate council um, and then we'll look at it and then get back to you and advise where the best place for that to go is. Additionally, you can just email any of the portfolio managers. Um, so all of our emails are available online so you can find those and just drop us an email and we're more than happy to discuss that. <coughs> 